right, today we are gonna talk about the hot zone. So you might've heard of the hot zone. It was both a book and a, a TV mini series in 2019. Um, and it's based on real life events. We're gonna talk more about the real life events. So this is a case study of a crisis that wasn't, and you'll see why as we go. Okay, so first of all, our story starts at Hazleton Research Projects in Reston, Virginia in November of 1989. So this was a facility that did research. It was essentially a private type of facility. And the research they were doing uh, involved animals and specifically it involved monkeys of various kinds. So pri non-human primates, in this case, a number of them were brought over from the Philippines. So hundred monkeys were brought over from the Philippines and then some of them started getting sick. So I believe like five monkeys showed some symptoms of what had a high likelihood of being simian hemorrhagic fever. So the symptoms they were showing were similar to simian hemorrhagic fever. It's a known virus that affects different kinds of non-human primates. Okay, so let's talk about that from a viral perspective. So simian hemorrhagic fever is caused by the Delta Arteri virus, Hemvev, which is in the family Arteriviridae. So when we're learning about viruses, the key thing is that we want to be able to understand what they're like and categorize and classify them as we do with just about everything. To do that, we have a number of characteristics that we're interested in. We're interested in the nucleic acid content of the virus. So viruses can have either DNA or RNA. And in each case, it can have some different types of strands. DNA is usually double-stranded, but it could be single-stranded. And RNA is almost always single-stranded, but it could be either positive sense or negative sense stranded, which will come up a little bit later. So all of those are important. One of the virus has an envelope. So some viruses just are nucleic acid and a protein capsid covering them, but then some have a lipid membrane or envelope surrounding them. And that can tell us what kind of virus it is. We want to know about its shape and its size. So many viruses have some different geometric shapes to the way that their membrane or their entire protein system is put together. And they can range from very, very tiny to still pretty small, but at least a little bit bigger depending. And then we also wanna know what hosts the virus is able to infect. Viruses are host limited. So knowing that it can only, for example, infect primates or other related creatures might be important versus knowing whether or not it can infect humans. So the host specificity of viruses is key. So simian hemorrhagic fever. If you look up the Delta Arteri virus, and I advise that you give this a go just so you can practice it, you would find that it's got a positive sense single stranded RNA. It does have an envelope and it is a spherical uh, virus at about 45 to 60 nanometers, which is extremely small. And its host specificity is, specificity is to equids, so horses and other related types of organisms, pigs, opossums, non-human primates, and rodents. Simian hemorrhagic fever is unlikely to infect a human host. So at the time, in Reston, they figured everything was just fine. The monkeys were sick, but it would be okay. So here you can see the structure of this virus. Inside it has its RNA. That's the RNA inside of it. Then it's got the protein capsid surrounding it. And then outside it has an envelope, so that's the circle. And in the envelope are a number of spike proteins made out of glycoproteins, which are uh, contain both carbohydrate and protein and are used to help attach to the specific host. So the scientist arrested did want to confirm that this was the virus. So they took some samples and they did put them under a microscope. And when they did, instead of finding a spherical virus, they found this virus. And this is a little different than what they were expecting. So now, now they have to go on a hunt to figure out what kind of virus this might be. Now, you might already know if you've seen this before, it's got a very familiar shape, but we are going to use this as an excuse to learn a little more about viruses. So pretend you don't know what this is for a second. And if you don't, here's some information about it. So this virus, first of all, is negatively stranded RNA. So that's a little bit different already. It does still have an envelope, which is why it's able to be stained and seen under the microscope. However, it is filamentous instead of spherical, so it's a much longer type of virus. And it is 80 nanometers wide, but can be up to 14,000 nanometers long. So as you can see, it's got a much, much longer 
body and length and will come out very differently under a microscope. So knowing this, that actually limits us to a point to the things we could examine because viruses are split up by a number of ways. All of these features are involved in how viruses are split up. The nucleic acid is one of the biggest ones. So there's multiple ways to classify viruses. One of them is the Baltimore classification. And that one specifically lumps them into classes that are completely related to what kind of DNA or RNA they have. So you can see we've got different kinds of DNA, double-stranded, single-stranded. We've got double-stranded RNA, which is pretty uncommon. And then a few others, but down here are the major classes where we have negative-stranded RNA and positive-stranded RNA. The key here, of course, is that the positive strand immediately acts like mRNA and can create proteins. However, the negative strand is going to need to be complementary transcribed first before it can be used to make proteins. In other systems, the international classification of viruses, the ones in this class 5 group also belong to a group called Nagarna viracota, which includes the mostly enveloped uh, negative single-stranded RNA viruses that affect various kinds of mostly vertebrates, but a few of these cross over into some other places. All right, so here's what you should do. Take a moment and learn a little bit about these viruses. They're all very interesting. And they all have a little bit of information that would help you figure out if they are the one from before. So you can easily search these see what their size and shape is, see if they're spherical or filamentous, some of them are bullet shaped, see what kinds of hosts that they infect. So if we think the virus we found is one of these, what might it be and how would we, and would we need to be worried about it? So would the scientists at Breston say, well, this virus is very similar to a different one, but it wouldn't infect humans anyway, or, oh, hey, this is a human pathogen or similar to a human pathogen and we should check it out. So. Viruses you have almost definitely encountered in your life fall into the paramyxoviridae category, the orthomyxoviridae category, um, and possibly the pneumonoviridae category, and a few of the more rare ones, but that come up in the news include the filovirus rhabdoviridae and buniviridae. So there are questions about these on the quiz that goes with this, so you will want to look each of them up. Okay, but I will get to the good part, which is that one of those groups contains the Ebola virus. And it turns out that that look, that filamentous uh, viral structure is fairly specific to Ebola virus. So is that a problem? Well, Ebola virus can be a problem. It reservoirs in fruit bats. So you'll find uh, populations of fruit bats mostly in Africa and a few other places that consistently have Ebola virus if you could test for it, but it does not make the bats sick. So that makes them a reservoir. It's a place where the virus hangs out, but doesn't cause disease. All right, so then it travels from the fruit bats to its local hosts, which tend to be non-human primates. So chimpanzees, gorillas, various kinds of monkeys. So those are the main hosts of Ebola virus. And then from there, it can travel to humans and humans can absolutely be Ebola virus hosts. And it has a pretty high mortality rate in humans who catch it. So it's definitely something to be worried about. And so let's think a little bit more about what that means. All right, so how does Ebola transmit? Well, vectors, which are animals that transmit it, are really the non-human primates and the bats, depending on what you come in contact with. So if a human came directly in contact with the bat, the bat would be the vector, but if not, it would be the non-human primates. And it does not, uh, it does this mechanically, not biologically. So it's not like something has to bite you to get it into you. It's just any kind of fluid on any of your internal surfaces, mucous membranes, into a cut, anything like that. Now, because of that, it also can transmit pretty easily on fomites, so long as those fomites have those fluids and things on them. So if the monkeys get fluids on them, got it on the cages, and then you touch the cages with no protective equipment, that could be a problem for transmission. It can be in some droplets, but they have to be fairly large droplets, and the animal has to be fairly sick for it to make it to you. Ebola is not airborne, so it cannot just travel in the air and it does not stay in the air. It stays pretty much in the fluids. You have to get the fluid on or in you and on or in one of your mucous membranes to get it. 
Also, there's not a lot of asymptomatic transmission. There are people who don't die, but there's not a lot of people with no symptoms from Ebola. If there's enough virus to transmit, there's enough virus to cause trouble in some manner. So if you're working there, would you be a little bit concerned? Well, probably at least a little bit because the likelihood of being exposed to Ebola from the monkeys if you were taking care of them is probably pretty high. Most of the time, people were probably not necessarily taking care of them. They might have been wearing some gloves, but maybe not too much too carefully. They probably were not wearing masks, but it depends. And uh, that would mean that there's a high amount of possible transmissions. So what should they do? Well, they don't want to clean everything. Make sure that they, if they have been exposed, uh, stay away from other people for at least an extended period of time. As you can see in this image from the TV series, they went all through the yards of making sure that they were completely in suits and things like that. We now know that that probably wouldn't have been necessary with Ebola, but you still want to be fairly careful. It's a pretty nasty virus and you wouldn't want to get it on or in you. So people did, in fact, in 1989, suit up pretty effectively to keep out of the way. Now, in terms of whether or not you've been exposed, viruses do not typically immediately show reproduction in the system because they have to reproduce within cells. So there's a process that viruses go through. So here you can see the Ebola virus, and we're going to walk through this process. First of all, it comes to the cell and it attaches to the receptors on the outside. So the glycoproteins or spike proteins connect to the receptors on the cell. Then the cell is able to say, oh, I should grab you. So it triggers something to take it up within a vesicle using some form of endocytosis. I believe Ebola might even use a form of penocytosis. And then it is able to release just the nucleic acid. So this is the RNA that is needed to make new viruses. Now this is a negative strand RNA. So the first thing that happens is actually it needs to make the positive strand RNA or an mRNA. So it will need to synthesize RNA using the cell's RNA synthesis mechanism. And then the mRNAs or the positive sense can easily go to ribosomes and be turned into proteins. Now, a virus needs a bunch of pieces. It needs proteins, so we're going to make the proteins through the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus, so that's good, especially the ones that will be pushed on the outside. So some proteins are made internally, and some are made to go on the outside of the envelope, which is a membrane. And we're actually, we're going to borrow the cell's membrane for this. And then we also need the RNA to go inside, and that's just straight replication. In this case, it will actually create the positive sense RNA first, and then a negative sense one that will go forward into the virus. So the negative sense one goes to where the virus proteins are attached to the cell membrane, and it's able to use essentially exocytosis, a, or at least a version of that where the membrane wraps around the viral nucleic acid and it buds or pinches off from the membrane and becomes a new virus and it can keep going. You'll notice that the animal cell here is not destroyed in any way. Most Animal cell viruses specifically actually want to keep their cells alive so they can keep making viruses over and over again. So what happens is the viruses slowly begin to get produced. Viral loads will slowly start to go up. It still takes a while for symptoms to show because symptoms are not typically related directly to the virus, but to the cells that are attacking the virus. So eventually the immune system will go, wait a second, you don't belong here. And it will send a whole bunch of immune cells over and say, wait a second, this cell is a virus making factory. It will send inflammatory cytokines and other things and it will destroy it. And that's what starts to happen. So there's an incubation period. And it's quite a while in the case of some viruses. Some of them come up quickly and it depends on how much virus you get. But Ebola specifically can take actually a very long time from two to 21 days before you would ever see symptoms or before we'd expect it to be out of somebody's system. So people actually did have to be quarantined and put out of the way and have their blood taken regularly for three weeks after the rest of the incident. So an incubation period of up to 21 days. So what happened here with the crisis that wasn't? Obviously, if this had actually been a case of Ebola as you know it, you would have heard about this because it would have been an actual crisis. People would have gotten Ebola. And if people had gotten Ebola, people most likely would have died. People definitely thought it was a very nasty strain of Ebola. In fact, when the virus was found, they did immune assays that related it to Ebola Zaire, which has a 90% or so mortality rate. Most people get Ebola Zaire die. In immune assays, 
We take antibodies, so something that attaches to the proteins on the outside, and these ones we're able to attach. And then we attach another antibody to the one we attach to it, and it makes something click or glow or reflect in a particular kind of microscope. In the case of these, it used a gold immunoassay, and it essentially puts gold particles all along the outside of the membrane. So you can see the dark coloring on the SEM is the immuno part of it being picked up on the SEM. So it looked like immuno, uh, it looked like Ebola Zaire because those were the antibodies that were used. And in fact, at least four of the people who worked with monkeys did show seroconversion or antibodies in their blood specific to Ebola. So they showed antibodies up into that period of time, but nobody got sick. So why did that happen? Why would nobody have gotten sick if this was actually Ebola Zaire? The answer is because it wasn't Ebola Zaire. It turns out that there are multiple strains of Ebola. There's actually six total. Four of them are known to cause disease in humans. And this happened to be one of the ones that didn't. So first of all, it was the first time this strain had been directly detected and the first time any Ebola had been detected on US soil. They named it after the location, Ebola Reston. So this is a strain of Ebola that although it can get into and clearly do some multiplying in humans, but not very much because it doesn't cause disease in humans. However, it's got a similar enough envelope and spike protein structure to pick up the same antibodies. So people thought that they had a major problem and fortunately they only had a minor problem. But because of this, we have gotten to learn a little bit about viral structure viral properties and viral replication, and how similar viruses can be different. A couple of other things that have come out of Ebola restin is, of course, being able to rapidly identify a virus and what to do if we think there's going to be some kind of outbreak or problem and how to be better prepared for it. So there's two more videos that I want you to watch along with this. I have linked to them on Blackboard, and uh, I'll also put them in the comments here. So there's a video on YouTube that goes to a news story that talks to one of the people who was involved in Ebola restin situation. And then there's a link to a TED talk from one of the main doctors who was involved in the Ebola restin work, outbreak management, cleanup, and things like that. For that one, you only need to watch the last four minutes, but I think you should watch it carefully and think about what he says, because in 2016, uh, this scientist was warning us that, hey, Outbreaks can happen. If they're airborne, they're going to be worse, and we might not be prepared. And it looks as though that was accurate. Hospitals were not ready for an influx of patients. We were not ready with PPE, and we certainly were not ready to understand a new viral outbreak even uh, within the last couple of years. So it's worth remembering, especially if you ever want to work in any medical field in the healthcare area, that if everybody on the ground has some awareness that there's lots of strains of viruses. They can look the same in some cases and not in others. And they all have different forms of transmission that we should be aware of. You can pick up quickly if something seems off and immediately take things, make sure people are in the right spots, make sure you can stop any kind of outbreak. So something worth keeping an eye on. All right, I hope you enjoyed that little case study and don't forget to complete the assignment on Blackboard.